Hi everybody, I'm Razvi. Welcome to another video from the Binary Exploitation series. In this video, we will be solving the ninth challenge from Trihagmi Spoon 101 room. In order to do so, we will be performing an attack known as Return to LibC, or simply Red to LibC. This exploitation technique is very useful since it allows us to bypass mitigations like the no execute bit when we aren't allowed to execute code from the stack or heap. And by the means of red to libc, we will be executing code that's already present in the memory of the process, specifically in the standard C library, also known as libc, which, as you may already know, is a dynamically linked library. That means that its addresses are affected by ASLR. However, if we manage to leak addresses from the global offset table or GOT, we will be able to bypass also ASLR. This is one of the most common challenges in CTFs where you have to perform form stack-based exploitation. Return to libc-like challenges are almost always present. So to sum up, in this video we will see step-by-step step how to perform a red to libc attack. We will discuss both the theory and practice in order to fully understand what's going on. There is, however, some prior knowledge that you must have in order to understand what we are about to do, but don't worry because I have recorded videos on every single concept that is needed. I will refer you to them when they are required. So, without further ado, let's get straight into it. Before beginning, however, as always, if you want to learn more about how to exploit a red to libc attack, there are, of course, references galore on the internet, and I will mention just some of them. For example, the entry of return to libc attack on the Wikipedia is very nice. For a first general overview of the attack, we have return to libc by Saif el Sherey from ExploitDB. We also have Return to LibC by Red Teaming Experiments, I Red Team. And finally, we have an entry from the Almighty Frag magazine called The Advanced Return into LibC Exploits. But before jumping straight into our vulnerable binary, just a small history lesson and some interesting facts about the Return to LibC attack. This attack was first documented and executed by this guy right here, back in the late 90s. This guy, which is usually known as Solar Designer, whose real name is Alexander Pesliak, sorry if I mispronounce it, is one of those big names in the history of exploitation. He was way ahead of his time back in the 90s, and the exploitation techniques that he first performed are still used nowadays. For example, Return to LibC, that we are about to see in this video, generic heap-based buffer overflows. He proposed several mitigations and contributions against privilege escalation attacks, and many more in the Open Wall project. He is also the creator of John the Reaper, a very useful and widely used password cracking tool. And now, after paying our respects and tribute to Solar Designer, let's get down to business. I've already downloaded the binary and I will disassemble it using Cutter. And in the meantime, let us execute it to see what's happening here. Go ahead. Okay, let us provide some input and it waits for input and then it finishes. So let us inspect it. As always, let us first check the information of the binary itself like its protections and its architecture. It has been compiled for 64 bits and we can see the no execute bit is enabled. That means that we cannot execute shellcode, neither from the stack or the heap. It isn't a position independent executable, so the addresses of the binary itself won't change between executions. There are no canaries present on the stack and we can see the binary hasn't been stripped, which will ease the reversing of the binary. Okay, let us now take a look at the functions the binary has declared. We can see there is nothing of interest. We have the main and no suspicious function so far. And also let us check the strings that are present in the binary. Maybe we find some clue or hint about how to exploit this binary. And there is nothing of interest. Okay, so let us first inspect the main function. In the main function, we can see there is a call to setup to banner, as always, which we don't really care about. Then there is a call to puts, to the imported function puts, that prints the string, this time no and some emojis. And then there is a call to get s. As we all know by now, get s is one of those functions that you never want to use because it's vulnerable by default. It doesn't limit the number of characters the user can write into memory and gets writes in the s buffer, whose address is rbp-20. In other words, this gets called right here 
allows us to overflow the stack and hijack the execution flow when the main function returns, writing into memory from rbp-20. In fact, I have already started writing the exploit file and I have noted for myself that gets writes from rbp-20 and even though this payload by itself isn't of use right now, we know that at some point during our exploit we will overwrite the return address of main, so we need 20 in hexadecimal bytes to reach rbp and 8 more to overwrite rbp itself. Whatever we concatenate to payload now, we'll start overwriting the return address of main. Now, the $1 million question is, where do we want to jump when we overwrite the return address of main? Where do we want to hijack the execution flow? What do we want to overwrite the return address of main with? Well, there is no function of use. There isn't a red to win situation. We have no strings that we could use for anything in this binary. And apparently there is nothing we could do. Well, this is usually the scenario and also a clue for yourself when you are dealing with a red to libc binary that can be exploited using red to libc. When we are performing a red to libc attack, what we want to do is somehow leak the addresses of the GOT, the global offset table of functions from standard C library, from libc. If we do so, we are able to know to discover the version of libc that the binary is dynamically linking. We want to do this on the remote side, remotely, because if I execute this binary in my machine, it will use my version of libc. However, I want to exploit this binary remotely. And how can we leak addresses from the GOT? Of course, by jumping to the PLT. If you don't know what the PLT or the GOT are, or you feel like you should know more in order to fully understand what they are and what do they do, I have previously recorded a video about this very topic, about what the global offset table and the procedure linkage table. In this video you will find everything you want to know or you need to know from a binary exploitation perspective about this two binary section and mechanisms that the system has in order to resolve addresses of dynamically linked functions. Now, coming back to our binary, when we are performing a red to libc, what we want to do is call puts and passing to puts the addresses, rather said the positions in the global offset table of functions that are already loaded or dynamically resolved in order for us to get their addresses from the library. If we manage to print or to leak the addresses of several libc functions once they are already loaded, remember that functions from external libraries, dynamically linked libraries, a process that is known as lazy binding. That's how dynamic resolution works if the binary has been compiled with partial relocation read-only mitigation or protection, which in this case it has. These addresses you see on the screen right now, which correspond to the GOT section of the binary, the global offset table, correspond to the functions puts, gets and set vbuff, for example. And this number will be resolved for the very first time this function is used in the binary. It needs to be resolved because it will represent the offset of the function in the external library, in this case the standard C library. So the values that we see here in the GOT are nothing than just addresses once they're already loaded. Right now, the numbers you see here are just uh, numbers that will be overwritten. This is an indication that the function, the address hasn't been resolved. So these are addresses that we need to leak. And in the PLT, which is this section we have right here, we don't have addresses, we don't have values. We have actual instructions that are called, are invoked whenever an external, an imported function is used by our binary. That's why if we take a look at main, when the puts function is used, for example, here, we see it is calling, it is referencing the PLT section, procedure linkage table, calling the entry for the puts function. In other words, when our binary uses this imported function puts, it will call to its entry in the PLT and the PLT, the procedure linkage table, will invoke the dynamic linker in case the entry on the global offset table for the puts function hasn't been resolved yet. If it has, that is, if the function has been already used previously in the binary, it will just jump there. The execution will jump outside of our binary in this case to the standard C library. 
So let us recap for a moment. We want to abuse this gets function right here to overwrite the return address of main and we want to jump to puts. We want to call puts because we want to print to the standard output the addresses the entries of the global offset table of other functions present in the standard C library. In this case, the global offset table of this binary has nothing than just these functions you see right here. Gets, set vbuff and also puts that we have previously seen. So we can call puts and pass it as a parameter. These addresses right here, remember that this binary isn't a position independent executable, so these addresses won't change because we are in the GOT, in the global offset table right now, and the address of the GOT entry of the puts function, which will tell us the address of the puts function within the external library, won't change. What will change is the value it contains, but not the address itself. In fact, that's the very reason why we have to jump to the PLT first, because PLT contains instructions while the GOT contains nothing than just values, addresses that do not correspond to instructions or to valid instructions rather said, instructions that we could make use of. And if we manage to print those addresses, those values from the GOT, well, what we can do is jump back to main once again to execute main once again. And once we know what version of libc the remote machine is using, we can calculate, we can get the offsets of functions like, for example, system or exec ve and pass it as a parameter, the address of the string dash bin dash sh, which is already present in libc. What we are about to do is a two-stage exploit. We will first abuse the vulnerable gets function to leak some addresses from the GOT. We will then execute main once again. And once we have all the information we need, we will jump right to the addresses of system exec-v or whatever we want. Now, before proceeding, let me tell you that it is pretty important for you to know what return-oriented programming is, because that is the foundation of what we are about to do, because we will concatenate several points portions of code already present in the binary in order to change registers and then we will call functions. We will concatenate gadgets, rob gadgets. In case you don't know what return oriented programming is, I have also created a video on that very topic where I explain in detail in depth what return oriented programming is, how you can abuse it and what it is useful for. I will also link this video in the description of course. When you are facing this kind of binaries, you want to leak addresses, entries from the GOTO functions that have been already used before you are actually exploiting it. In this case, it is pretty easy because we have just these three functions. However, it could happen that the binary imports or declares, I don't know, for example, 20 functions and it only uses three or four of them before the vulnerability happens. And these three or four functions are those that you want to leak. And now let us get into the exploit, finally. I have, as always, declared the context, the binary that we will be analyzing and executing, and this is our binary. And of course, I am using Poon tools. So now, since we will be performing a wrap attack, we want to know, or we need to know, how the puts function works. In this case, we will be using puts to leak information, to leak the values of the global offset table entries and puts receives nothing than just one parameter which corresponds to the string that it will print. And as you may already know, in C, strings are nothing that a pointer to a sequence of chars. Okay, so we know that puts receives just one parameter. And why do we care? Well, because we want to know, since we are exploiting a 64-bit architecture binary, a 64-bit binary, we want to know what register we need to modify in order to specify the parameter that puts receives. Remember that in 64 bits binaries and architectures, parameters are passed to functions via registers rather than via the stack. And given the calling convention that we are working with in Linux systems, the first parameter is passed in the RDI register. So let us check the binary for gadgets and let's see if we can modify the RDA register before jumping to the PLT entry for the put function. We want to modify the RDA register because we want to call puts and we want it to print whatever we desire. And we can achieve it by modifying the RDA register, which is the first and only parameter puts receives. 
Now in order to look for gadgets in our binary, I will be using rob gadgets, specifying of course the binary I wanted to analyze, the depth for the search engine and redirecting the output to a file called gadgets.txt. And as we have just seen, we need something that modifies the RDA register. Luckily enough for us, we have a perfect gadget right here that has no side effects and we will be using this one right here. So let me copy its address and I have pasted it in the exploit using the pack 4 64 bits because I want to convert this value. If you don't know what NDNS is or why it is a key concept in binary exploitation, I have also created a video about NDNS, which I will link in the description of course. In this video I explain the main differences between big and little Endian for both 64 and 32 bits. As you can see, in fact, in the video itself I'm using PAC 432 and PAC 464, which is what we are using right now. Okay, so now how can we call the puts function in the first place? Well, in order to call puts function what we can do is just mimic or copy the behavior, the legit behavior of the binary. And as you can see, when the binary itself calls to puts, it does so by referencing the PLT section. In other words, what we can do is jump to this very address right here that corresponds to the PLT entry of the puts function. In order to jump to this particular address right here, given that the binary isn't position independent, I could just copy this address and paste it in the exploit or we could make use of the elf function or module from Poon Tools. Given that we have loaded into memory everything, every symbol of this binary, what we can do here is for example, let's say I want the PLT puts address, so I could simply call to binary.plt.puts. Internally, Poon Tools will resolve the address of the puts function in the PLT section of the binary that we have loaded using the elf module. And this variable right here has now a value that's ready to use. We have said that we need to call PLT and we want to pass it as parameter the addresses of the GOT entries of several functions. For this, just the same principle applies. We could go to the GOT entry and copy this address, but what I will do is use the tools that Poon Tools offers me. In other words, let's say that I want to print the GOT entry for the puts address, so I could simply say binary that GOT that puts. And this will internally resolve the entry for the puts function in the GOT section of the binary. And just like before, I need it to be little endian for 64 bits. I have also loaded now the addresses of the GOT entry for the other two functions that our binary is importing, as you can see here, because I want to print the address of all of them. And now let us create the payload that will actually print or leak all this information that we need. So after overwriting up to and including the RBP, we will overwrite the return address of main. And we first want to return to pop RDI gadget because we want to execute this instruction. We want to hijack the execution flow at this instruction because we want to define what puts will actually print. And let's say that first I want to print the puts entry for the GOT. Then I will pass this address right here. And once the RDA register is finished, when this red instruction right here gets executed, I want to jump to the PLT entry for the puts function because I want to execute the actual puts so it will print the GOT entry. In order to make it easier to understand I will change it just like so and we can repeat this calling three times and each time we will change the GOT entry that we want to leak. If you don't know what is happening in memory when all these gadgets are chained together, in other words, with this wrap chain, how these instructions modify the RIP and RSP register. I recommend you watching my video on the return oriented programming so you can understand everything that's going on inside into memory. Let us send the payload and let us call to interactive in order to see everything that it printed so far, even though right now we won't get the shell. 
let us execute it with Python 3. As you can see, it prints the banner and the string of the binary. And now I have to press a key in order to see whatever it printed. And of course, we got an end of file because there isn't a shell. And we got printed the addresses of the three functions that we have specified. Let us execute it once again. And as you can see right now, we have all these three addresses. We have managed to successfully leak the values of the GOT entries of several functions once they have been dynamically resolved. Now what I'll do is modify the script so it automatically parses these addresses and be able to work with them and also change it so the execution is performed remotely, thus leaking the addresses of the remote library of the remote machine and completing the first stage of the exploit. Okay, the script is now modified and let's see the changes that I've made. Before that, just remember that when you are developing your exploit, you can use the context.log level equal to debug in order to see what information the process you are executing sends to you and what you are sending back to the process. With that being said, what I've done here is that first I am receiving all the output of the process until Puntools parses the word ahead front of the string because we are receiving actual bytes. And then I'm using another receive call that will parse, will receive bytes until the next new line character or byte is found. That is because after the word ahead, there is the emoji, which is basically garbage that I want to get rid of. Remember that when we are executing the binary, we have this emoji here after the word ahead. After all of that, I am sending the payload, which will print the addresses as we have seen in previous executions. And then I am receiving all that information and then I'm splitting all the addresses. Remember from previous executions that each address we are leaking is printed in a separate line. So this way we can have all of them in an array format in the output variable. And then I am just simply parsing them. In this case, I am using the unpack for 64 bits which basically does the opposite operation as the pack 464. Let me remind you that when we have an actual integer that we want to convert to an actual sequence of bytes in little endian, we use the pack 464 bits. Now what happens when we have a sequence of bytes that is already in little endian and we want it to convert back to an actual integer? Well, what we have to do is instead of packing for 64 bits, we are unpacking from 64 bits. I am parsing each one of them separately and I am using the left justify in order to make it an actual eight bytes long value because we are unpacking from 64 bits, which are eight bytes. We need the eight bytes sequence in order to be able to convert it back to an actual integer. That means that I am padding to the right with the null character, with the null byte rather said, until the total length of the byte sequence is eight, eight bytes in this case. And then I am just printing the actual values. So that being said, we will have the values corresponding to the global offset tables entries that we have just leaked ready to use. Let us execute the exploit to see if it actually works. And as you can see, we are leaking and parsing the values of the memory addresses. As you can see, all of them are pretty close to each other. So we can basically assume that these values are correct. Now, one thing that could happen and you must consider it, you have to take it into account is that maybe when addresses get randomized, remember that we are leaking addresses from a dynamically linked libraries. These addresses are affected by ASLR. So when they are randomized, it could happen that they contain a null byte since we are using puts function to leak these addresses that interprets data as a string. It means that puts will print until it finds the null character because in C strings are null terminated by default. That means that a null character, a null byte is an indication that the string we are printing ends there. And when that happens, as you can see in this execution, the addresses that you are leaking are of course incorrect, but it doesn't really matter. All you have to do is execute the exploit once again until you have no null bytes in the addresses you are leaking. And now that we have successfully leaked the addresses locally, let us do the same remotely and move to the next stage of the exploit. So I have modified the script to connect to a given IP address and the given port instead of a local process. And then I executed the script. 
This time, as you can see here, I got an error because an index I tried to access was out of range. In order to solve these issues, to be able to debug these issues, rather said, we can enable the debug log level. Now, if we execute the script, the exploit, once again, we are able to see how many bytes we have sent to the remote side of the connection and how many bytes and what bytes, of course, we have received. And when you are trying to debug or fix these kind of errors that happen when you are communicated with the process over a network connection, my recommendation is to always try to start fixing it by implementing the easiest solution. In this case, what I see here is that I am receiving just the first leaked address. That's why the array, the variable output is empty. It has only the zeroth index while the first is of course out of range. What I suppose here is that I am not receiving all the bytes that the process is actually sending to me. In order to fix it, it is as simple as instead of calling just a receive here, I will call receive all. And now let me try it. And as you can see, it now works just as intended. We have here the leaked addresses of the remote side of the connection of the victim's machine. With this information, with these values, we are actually able to calculate, to discover the version of the standard C library, libc, that the server is using. So now, how can we do that? Let me execute it once again. And now, if we take a closer look, what we can appreciate, what we can notice is that the last three nibbles of each address is exactly the same regardless of the randomization that ASLR introduces. Because ASLR does not randomize the full address, it randomizes only a portion of it. And this is something that I intend that I plan to discuss in a future video. But for now, we have to notice that the first two nibbles, the first byte, and the last three nibbles, the last byte and a half, are consistent, are always the same. The part of the address that is randomized are just these nibbles right here. And this is precisely what allows us to calculate or discover the libc version that the server is using. Because every libc version has its own offsets for its functions, and the offsets are, of course, represented by the last three nibbles, because the rest of the address, well, of course, aside from the very first byte, is randomized. So, in other words, since these addresses are from the server, the libc version in which the puts function is at offset AA0, and gets function is at offset 190 and set the buff function is at offset 3d0 that's the version we are looking for okay so how can we look for specific offsets in several versions of libc well what we have to use is a libc database however luckily for us there are online tools that allow us to do just that. There are several online tools and services that you can query for specific functions and their offsets in order to discover the specific libc version that you are looking for. I will show you just three tools and you can use any of them. These tools are libc.nullbyte.cut, libc.bluecut.me and also libc.rip. So for example, let's say I will use libc.nullbyte.cut. I can specify here the function that I want the search engine to take into account, which is the put function, and I have to write down just the last three nibbles, the offset of the function. In our case, as we have leaked from the server, it is AA0. Then the next function, for example, gets, we can see it is 190. And the last but not least, the set v buff function, whose offset is 3d0. Now we click find and after just a couple of seconds, the website returns the results. These are the libc versions that match our query, the offsets of the functions that we specified. As you can see, it has two possible versions of libc that the server might be using, but we do not really care. My bet is that there isn't a big difference between the both of them. So now, once we have leaked the version of the libc that's running in the remote server, we will go straight into our second stage. And that is, we will jump to main once again in order to repeat the execution 
only that this time our payload won't leak any address because we already know what version of the library is running in the server. This time we will use the information we have just leaked in order to spawn a shell. Now how can we do that? Where? Here is where these tools come in to save the day once again. These are amazing tools whose usefulness is way beyond words. If we click in one of these libraries, what we get here is a list of symbols with their offset relative to the symbol that we got selected. And as you can see, we have here system and also the string dash bin dash sh. This is a string, this is not a function. We could also inspect all the symbols in the library. Now, as you can see here, we got printed the offset of system, of read, write, also open and also string bin sh because these are the most used symbols when it comes to binary exploitation and we also have the offsets of the functions that we specified and this is very useful because here comes the trick if we select that we want the offsets of system and every other function relative to gets because we already have the address of gets the dynamically linked address of gets we are leaking it with every single execution we now get the offset calculated relative to the gets address in other words as you can see the system function is at a lower address that means that we can call to system by calling the address of gets the dynamically linked address of gets and subtracting from that value this difference we see here and we can reference the string bin sh by adding to the address of gets this value we see right here this means that basically we can call to system and pass it as a parameter dash bin dash sh in order to spawn a shell by using addresses relative to the address of gets because we are leaking it in every single execution in our first stage of the exploit and now what we have to do is when we send our first payload in the first stage when we are leaking addresses we don't have to finish or to end our payload after this puts call we want to call mains once again in order to do that what we do need is of course the address of main and the address of main is very simple to obtain we can get the address of every function in the binary in order to do so we can call to binary that symbols that main and of course we want to pack it for 64 bits because we want a little indian byte sequence in other words, the first time we are exploiting this get function, we will be leaking the addresses of the global asset table. We are executing main once again. And the second time we are executing this vulnerable get, we will be spawning a shell by calling to system dash bin dash sh. So we need the padding just like that. And now what we need is, of course, we want the RDI register to point to our dash bin dash sh string and in order to get the address of the bin sh string on the remote server during execution its dynamic address if you want to say it like so what we need is of course taking into account the leaked gets address we have to add the offset that the online tool has told us to do so and of course please bear in mind that after we add together the offset and the address what we have to do is of course pack it for 64 bits because we want an actual little endian sequence of bytes and now once we have set in the rdi register the value that we desired what we have to do is of course call system and how can we do it well we have to take into account the leak gets address and subtract the offset that we have discovered using the online tool do not forget to also convert it into an actual byte sequence Next, we have to obviously send the payload and then we have to simply spawn an interactive session because if everything works as intended, we should have already spawned a shell by this time, by the time this instruction gets executed. So let us try it once again. It isn't working. So there could be many reasons for this exploit to be failing right now. But as I said earlier, we should first start focusing on the easiest fixes to our exploit, to our script. Now, remember that in this whole trihagmi room, the remote machine is executing Ubuntu 18, which usually gives alignment problems. And that's precisely why I have wrote here at the beginning of the video and the exploit, just the red instruction, a rub gadget that is just that, a red instruction. 
because when we are dealing with Ubuntu 18, we have sometimes, in order to fix those alignment issues, to place a red, one or more reds, in fact, maybe one or several of them, right after our padding. So the first instruction that we hijack the execution to is a red, and then just continue executing our wrap chain. Let us test it now. As you can see, it is now working. So once again, let me just comment this debug log level. I will execute it once again. And now, as you can see, this time the exploit didn't work because even though the execution is correct, the addresses that we leaked contain null bytes. So puts didn't leak the whole address and we are unable to calculate the correct get address in order to get the relative addresses of the system function and the bnsh string. So never mind, we execute it once again. This time everything is correct and now it should be working. And as you can see, it is. Here we have our flag. Let us leak it, let us read it, and let's check if it is correct, which it is indeed. And this was the read to libc return to libc video. In this video, we have learned several things. First, we have seen for the very first time in the channel a stage or multi-stage exploit. That is, an exploit that first performs several actions, like for example, leaking some addresses, then it calls the vulnerable function once again, in this case main, and in the second execution, the second time the vulnerable function gets executed, we perform other actions based in the information we got in the first place. We have also seen what a red to libc attack is and how does it look like, and also how we can exploit a binary by performing it. We have leaked addresses from the global offset table by successfully jumping to the procedure linkage table. And by using return oriented programming, grub, we have successfully managed to modify register contents, register values, so as to leak the addresses and memory contents that are of interest for us. I hope you liked the video and found it useful. As always, if there is anything you want to say, leave a comment below. And remember, Exploit code, not people. See you in the next one. Until then, GG.